continuing in a series uh, that we've been in the past few weeks called Living the Blessed Life. And today we're uh, tackling this idea of the power of a plea. Because whether you realize it or not, we live in a culture, in a world that is big on pleas. In fact, over the course of your life and mine, we will make at least hundreds of pleas for all different things. We might plead with someone for something that we want. We might make a plea for something that we think we deserve. We might even make a plea to avoid what we do, in fact, deserve. A plea can simply be defined as an earnest request or an appeal. And we live in a world of pleas. Think about this. In the courts, in the justice system, there is something known as plea bargaining. And that plea bargaining can often lead to a plea agreement. And, and there are people who will plead for leniency or they will plead insanity. If you have a dog, you are familiar with the dog's plea as they sit at your feet or under the table pleading with you to just drop even just a little crumb of food so they can enjoy what you're eating too. There's an old hymn called Just As I Am. And in that song, we have the words, without one plea, which indicates the fact that on our own, we cannot be justified or, or made right or forgiven of our sin, that on our own merit, we cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. As children, we make lots of pleas. If you can think back to when you were a child or think of your own children. As children, we might plead with our parents not to punish us. We might plead with them to buy us something. A cell phone, a car, any other list of things, candy at the grocery store, who knows. As parents, we often plead with our children, don't we? We plead with them to behave. We plead with them to clean their room or to pick up after themselves. And I don't know about you, but that usually doesn't go real well, actually. We make our pleas, but oftentimes they are not answered. Sometimes we plead with our employer, with our boss. We might plea with them not to fire us. We, we might plea with them to give us a raise or, or to give us a promotion. Sometimes we even plead with God. And sometimes as we plead with God, it becomes sort of a, a heavenly version of let's make a deal. Ever done this? Oh God, if you will do this for me, then I promise I will do that for you. But we make pleas with God. Do this, do that, meet this need, bring this healing, forgive, provide, give. And so we're continuing this series in the book of the prophet Joel in the Old Testament of the Bible today called Living the Blessed Life, which is about more than just having the stuff of the world. Living the blessed life biblically means to live a life that is favored by God. That's what we're talking about here. How can we have a life that is favored by God? And as we've walked through this the past few weeks, we've seen that, that there is a big day coming. It is the day of the Lord, it is the day of God's wrath, when he will pour out his wrath against all the sin and all the injustices that are in this world today. And we've been encouraged through the prophet Joel to admit our failures, to repent of our sins, to turn from them, to walk with God, to walk towards God. And today we come to a plea that God makes with us, his people. And so as we dive into this today, we find ourselves in Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2, verses 12 through 17 
The subtitle is, Rend Your Heart. Beginning of verse 12, Joel chapter 2. It says, Even now, even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. And he relents from sending calamity. Who knows, he may turn and relent and leave behind a blessing, grain offerings and drink offerings for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, declare a holy fast, call a sacred assembly. Gather the people, consecrate the assembly, bring together the elders, gather the children, those nursing at the breast. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. Let the priests who minister before the Lord weep between the portico and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, Lord. Do not make your inheritance an object of scorn, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? And so in this text, God through his prophet, he's inviting us to embrace and and to experience the blessed life. A life that is favored by God as he pleads with us to take three very important, three specific actions. Actions And the first one is this, that we have to return. We have to return to our first love. Return to your first love. Look again in Joel 2 verse 12. Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Even now, return with all your heart. You see, after... The warning of of judgment and destruction to come. The prophet presents God's concern for all people. Why? Because God doesn't want anyone to be destroyed. God doesn't want anyone to spend an eternity apart from him in hell. And so the prophet is telling us about God's concern. And how God is constantly pleading with his people to have hearts that are broken and repentant. Friends, God is always pleading with his people. He's pleading with us right now here today. He's pleading with some of us to return to our first love. To to return to that kind of love and passion that we had for God. Back in the beginning when we first gave our lives to Jesus. He's pleading with some of us to give something up. He's pleading with some of us to to start doing something. Some of us, he's pleading with us to surrender something. And to just give it all over to him. God is always pleading with us to give him all of our hearts. To give him everything that we are and everything that we have and everything that we struggle with. And those words, even now, in this verse are so significant. Because those words, even now, indicate the truth, friends, that that no one, no one is outside of God's grace and mercy and forgiveness. No one. That no one has gone too far, that no one is too far gone, that no one has committed so much sin that they could never come to God or be forgiven by God. I remember several years ago when I was Flipping through the TV channels. You ever done that where you're just flipping through the TV channels? You know, you're bored. You, you can't find anything to watch. And you're flipping through the TV channels. And, and it was late at night. May, I don't know. Maybe it was early in the morning. I don't really remember. But I remember as I was flipping through the TV channels, I came across this television show that at the time I had never seen before. It, it was a television show that was intriguing. It caught my attention, but at the same time, it was so heartbreaking. The TV show 
was a show called Cheaters. Anybody heard of Cheaters? Maybe you've seen it. If you're not familiar with it, it's, it's this TV show that focuses on a team of private investigators that work with people who believe that their significant others are being unfaithful to them. And sadly, more often than not, what they discover is that they're right. There is unfaithfulness taking place, and it's heartbreaking. You know, what's interesting to me is that most people, even people who do not follow Jesus, would agree that adultery is wrong. And yet, even many people who are followers of Jesus don't give much thought to spiritual adultery, to spiritual unfaithfulness. And yet, friends, this is the very charge of God against us, his people. He's charging us with unfaithfulness. He's charging us with spiritual adultery. And at some point, at some time in our lives, we've all been the guilty one. We've all been spiritually guilty of of this spiritual adultery, this spiritual unfaithfulness to God. And yet, here's the amazing thing. In the midst of that unfaithfulness, God is not kicking us to the curb. He's not washing his hands of us, saying, you know what, I'm done with you. You, You've done too much, and I've put up with too much, and and I'm not going to forgive you again. No, in the midst of the unfaithfulness, God is pleading with us to come back. How incredible is that? Friends, that's why we come to worship. That's what gets me up in the morning. That's what makes me excited to gather here on a Sunday morning Because I know that I've been unfaithful. And yet God says, come back. I'll forgive you. I still love you. And he says the same thing to you. No matter what you have done, no matter what you're struggling with, no matter what burdens you have upon you, no matter what other people say about you, God says, I've not given up on you. I will forgive you. He's pleading with us to come back. To come back, as the prophet says, with all our hearts. With all your heart. And I love that phrase that we find here in this verse. With all your heart. Because it really is the heart that is at the heart of the problem. The very reason why we so often become unfaithful. It's because we don't give God all of our hearts. We don't surrender everything to him. We might give him a piece of our heart. We might surrender some things to him. But we don't surrender all of it to him. And we don't give all of our hearts to him. And this is not a new problem. This this is the very issue that Jesus was speaking into when he said originally to the church at Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, he says, yet I hold this against you. In other words, they were still doing like some good things. It wasn't like they completely went off the rails. But he says, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent. And do the things you did at first. Do the things you did at first. Return to your first love. I have a picture here we'll bring up on the screen. Look at those two kids right there. In case you can't tell, that's Stephanie and my my wife Stephanie and I. And that was taken a lot of years ago. In fact, that was very early on in our relationship. I I, I don't think we were engaged even at that time. We were just, I think, starting out in the dating relationship. And that picture was taken at the Ringling Brothers Circus in Knoxville, Tennessee, while we were college students. And uh, just just to let you know, I, I know people in high places. 
And because I did, I had gotten free tickets to the circus. Yeah, that's how I roll, friends. We even got to go backstage. I know, I know people in high places. I know how to impress. Or maybe not. I, I don't know. But you know, this January, we will celebrate 20 years of marriage. That was a long time ago. Sometimes it seems like a lifetime ago. And, and over that time, of course, we've changed. Our lives have changed. Our, you know, our, our, our mindsets have changed to a certain degree. Probably our personalities have changed. I mean, a lot has changed over the last 20 years. And it's not that change is bad. I mean, relationships do have a way of kind of evolving and changing over time. And, and over that time, we've dealt with a lot of different challenges, just like anybody would over that amount of time. But friends, if we're not careful what can happen, happen in a relationship, whether it's a relationship with a human being or our relationship with God through Jesus, what can happen is that complacency and comfort can seep into that relationship. Complacency and, and comfort can begin to replace the love that you had at first. Let me ask you, do you remember what it was like when you first believed? Do, do you remember what it was like when you first chose to love God, to honor Him, to make Him first in your life? Do, do you remember what that day was like when you chose to confess Jesus Christ? And to be obedient to him in that watery grave of baptism where we identify with the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Do you remember what that was like? Do you remember the, the excitement of that day, that event? Do, do you remember the freedom that you experienced? I've had the privilege to be able to baptize a good number of people in my in my years as a pastor, and frequently what I hear from them or, or what I hear from people that, that I talk with after they've been baptized is that, is that so often they say things like, I just felt as light as a feather. What is that? That's freedom, friends. That's freedom from our past. That's freedom from our sins and our failures and our mistakes and our regrets. Do you remember what it, like to ex what it felt like to experience that freedom in that moment? Do you remember the eagerness? You pop out of the baptistry and it's like you're ready to take the world by storm, you know, and, 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 and you just, you want to go out and tell everyone about Jesus and you want to serve him and you want to honor him and you want to love him. You're so excited to do it. But over time, what often happens is that excitement and that eagerness can fade and, and that spiritual flame inside of us begins to grow dim. And so, friends, returning to your first love, as the prophet instructs us in Scripture, it's about remembering that love you had at first. It's about remembering that excitement. It's, it's about remembering how great the gift of God is and how it changed your life and how it ought to still be changing your life. It's about intentionally finding ways to stoke that spiritual flame inside of you. Whether, whether it means we, we intentionally spend time in His Word because maybe we've gotten lax in that area. Or making sure that we are praying without ceasing and we have an active and ongoing prayer life. Or, or getting involved and saying, how can I serve? What can I do to make a difference? I want to make something of my life. I want to invest my life in something that's bigger than myself. We have to find ways to intentionally stoke that spiritual flame that is inside of us. Friends, if we're going to return to our first love, we have to get rid of the spiritual mistresses in our lives. And by spiritual mistresses, I'm talking about the competitors. 
the, the things in our lives that, that, that can so easily become more important to us than God. The things that maybe have become more important to us than God. Or the things that are threatening to become more important to us than serving and worshiping God. We have to get rid of the spiritual mistresses and return to our first love. Second action that the prophet says is to stop. Stop just going through the motions. We're going to return to our first love. That means we have to stop just going through the motions. Joel chapter 2 verse 13. It says, rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. And he relents from sending calamity. Rend your heart and not your garments. The idea here is that the people, they were trying to impress God. Like literally trying to impress God with the clothes that they were wearing. I like the way the New Living Translation of the Bible translates this verse. It says, don't tear your clothing in your grief. Instead, tear your hearts. And what that is a reference to is to how in that culture people would tear their clothing in addition to putting on sackcloth as a visible demonstration of grief. We we don't understand this. this. This doesn't make any sense in our culture because in our culture, people tear their clothing and they put on their holy jeans to look cool, right? I would have done it today, but I don't have any holy jeans. I, I'm not that holy, I guess. I don't know. But, but, but in that culture, people would intentionally tear their clothes just to make it look like they were grieving. To say, look, we're so sad. We're mourning. We're repenting. And God is saying, look, rather than letting your clothes be broken rather than letting your clothes be torn up let your hearts be broken in a spirit of repentance and yet these people they thought that they were loving God just by the clothes that they were wearing have you ever fallen into the same way of thinking? Certainly none of us here, right? But let me just tell you, friends, it can happen. It can be so easy to start believing that we're honoring God just because we're dressing a certain way or just because we're doing certain things or or because we're projecting a certain Image. Now, don't misunderstand me. It's good to do good things. But we have to ask, why are we doing them? Are we just going through the motions because we want people to think of us a certain way? Or are we doing them because we're trying to please God and our Savior Jesus who bled and died upon an old rugged cross for us, for me? And for you, why are we doing it? Sometimes, if I'm just being frank and and honest with you, sometimes I have to admit that I, I do some things or I have in the past done some things that are right, but I've just done it because it's right. I've I've done it because it's what I'm supposed to do. But maybe I didn't really do it because it's what's in my heart. Sometimes we do things, but our hearts aren't right. Sometimes we can begin to think that it is our good and right behavior, our actions... That determine God's love and acceptance for us. But friends, we need to be reminded that there is nothing we could ever do. There is nothing that we have ever done 
that could make God love us anymore. Because he's already crazy about you. He is. Even when you're not crazy about yourself. He's crazy about you. And we cannot do anything to make him love us anymore. Accept us anymore. God accepts you and he loves you. Not because of what you do. But because of his grace and because of his mercy. That's what it's about. His grace and mercy. It's why the prophet says in our text that God is gracious and compassionate. He's slow to anger and he is abounding in love. Abounding in love. I heard a story one day about a, um, a pastor who, after the service, went up to a, a, a woman and said, well, I, I noticed that your husband walked out in the middle of the sermon and he said well I was just hoping that I had not said anything to offend him and the wife quickly shot back by saying oh no don't worry about that at all she said my husband has been walking in his sleep for years (laughs) (laughs) and here's the truth here's the reality some of us we need to wake up from spiritual complacency God is pleading with us to wake up from spiritual complacency, to to become spiritually awake to all that he wants to do in us and through us. Because spiritually, some of us, we're just sort of going through the motions. We might be doing good things and and people might look at us and and think we have it all together and we're these spiritually mature people, but inside we know that we're just going through the motions. And God's pleading with us to wake up. Sadly, some of us may even be convinced that God is pleased with this. Again, it's not a new problem. It's the very issue, it's the problem that God was speaking into when he spoke through his prophet Isaiah in chapter 58 of Isaiah verse 2. He says, for day after day they seek me out. We're seeking them out, right? But it says, they seem eager. They seem eager to know my ways. As if they were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commands of its God. They ask me for just decisions, and they seem eager for God to come near. Friends, God is saying, it's not your actions, it's not your behavior that is done out of ritual and tradition that leads to a blessed life, that leads to a a life that is favored by God. It's a right and surrendered heart that does. And and here's the thing. When we have a right and surrendered heart, the right actions and the right behaviors have a way of naturally springing forth from us. See, it's, it's, it's a good thing to do right things. It's a, it's a good thing to live in a way that honors God. But we can't get the order out of order. <laughs> we, we can't get the process out of order. We have to have a right and surrendered heart. And if our heart is right and surrendered before God, then he will bring more good out of us than he does bad. Not perfection. None of us are that. But he will bring good things from us. It was the uh, famous author Leo Tolstoy who once said, everyone thinks of changing the world, but no one thinks of changing himself. (laughs) How true is that? We often tend to think the problem is someone else. We we have a tendency to want to point fingers at everyone else, right? To assess blame to everyone else and think, oh, it's their problem. They're the problem. They're the reason. We think someone else is the problem, but friends, often the path to a a better world and the path to a better community and the path to having better relationships and and to having a, a better church 
is about me. It's about you. It's about us as individuals. That, that sometimes it's all about doing what, what Michael Jackson so famously sang about. Looking at the man in the mirror or the woman in the mirror. Sometimes we just have to look at ourselves. And yet that's hard, isn't it? It's so much easier to look at other people. It's so much easier to point the finger at someone else. But if we want to live this favored life of God, the blessed life, if we want things to be better in our lives and in our community and in our world and in our church, we have to look at ourselves and say, is my heart right before God? Am I fully surrendered to God? Here's the last thing. The prophet says we've got to commit. We have to commit. We need to return to our first love. We have to return to our first love. And when we return to our first love, we have to get to that point where we commit. Commit to God and be blessed. Joel chapter 2, verses 14 through 16. Who knows? He may turn and relent and leave behind a blessing. Grain offerings and drink offerings for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Declare a holy fast. Call a sacred assembly. Gather the people. Consecrate the assembly. Bring together the elders. Gather the children, those nursing at the breast. Let the bridegroom leave his, leave his room and the bride her chamber. Let the priests who minister before the Lord weep. Who knows, he may turn and he may leave behind a blessing. The instruction here is to just stop doing whatever it is you're doing and do what is most important. It's why this, the, the verses speak of people coming together like if there are babies nursing, just stop it for a moment. If, if there's a husband and wife that are enjoying the, the, the marital union, just stop it for a moment. Come together. Everybody come together and do what is most important. And that is to seek God with all of our heart, with all of our mind, all of our soul, all of our strength. Seek God with all your heart. Friends, you have to understand the commitment to God it is the pathway to the blessed life. It is the pathway to living a life that is favored by God. And when we commit our hearts to serving and worshiping Him, God leaves behind a trail of blessings. I don't know about you, but I know how true that is. Because when I look at my life and I look behind, I see a trail of God's blessings. They're everywhere. Anybody else ever seen this in your life? You look behind and you're like, God, you've been so good to me. I don't deserve any of this. And yet everywhere I look, there are blessings. And, and I know that in a crowd like this, there, there are people that are dealing with some hard stuff. I know that. And I know that maybe... Maybe you're even in one of the hardest seasons of your life right now. And it seems like nothing is going right. And things are certainly not as, wish, as, as you would like them to be, as you wish them to be. But even still, I suspect that you can look around. That you can look behind you. And see a trail of blessings. Because that's what God does. God loves to bless his people, even in the mess, even in the problems, even in the midst of the situations that we wish would go away. God has a way of leaving blessing after blessing. It's what he does because he's good and he loves us. He loves us. And that commitment to God that leads to that favored life of God, it it begins, it doesn't end with, but it begins with an act of obedience. It's called baptism. We read in Romans chapter 6, verse, verse 4, we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life, that we may live a new life. I think you very easily say, 
that we can live the blessed life. A life favored by God. Not, not that we're going to always have a perfect life. Not that we're not going to have problems and trials. But in the midst of it all, we can live a blessed life favored by God. I don't know if you've ever heard the old story about the pig and the chicken. Not, why did they cross the road? That, that's a different story. But, but it's an old little story about a pig and a chicken that were walking past a, a church building one day. And as they were walking by, they, they saw this great, big, fancy gala charity event taking place. And seeing all of that, they got caught up in the spirit. And the pig turned to the chicken and suggested that they make a contribution to this charity event. To which the... The uh, chicken said, oh, he says, that, that sounds like a really great, great idea. And then, um, and then he said, well, let's offer them ham and eggs. <laughs> you know where I'm going with this? Pig said, whoa, whoa, whoa. Not so fast. He said, to you, that's a contribution. To me, that's a total sacrifice. And I think that's the exact point that God's trying to get across to us. Total sacrifice. Total commitment. Total commitment. Total commitment. That's the plea. Friends, that's the plea that God is trying to get us to understand. That's, that's the plea of God to us his church. He's asking for total commitment. You know, the truth is, we all want God's blessing, don't we? I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I, I've never met anybody that would say, you know what, I really wish that God would curse me. Like, I want to be cursed by God. I've never met anybody that said that. I think everybody wants the blessing of God, right? The question is, though, are you willing to commit to him to receive that blessing, to receive that favor, that favor of God? Are you willing to commit to a life of obedience in order to receive his favor? Our worship team's going to come up now and uh, lead us in a song of worship. And it's also a time of, of decision if the Lord is laying something on your heart. And urging you to come back to him. And uh, as they come to prepare, prepare to lead us in song, I just, I just want to ask you, what is it that you're seeking first? Like, I, I know that, that you're seeking God on some level. I mean, you're here today. And I'm glad you're here today. But what is it that you're seeking first? What, what is it that is most important to you? And are you seeking God with all your heart? With all your heart. Friends, is it time to return? To return to your first love? Have you allowed some comfort and complacency to creep into your life spiritually? And maybe you've gotten to the point where sometimes you're just honestly going through the motions. And it looks good on the outside, but in here, something ain't right. Is it time to return to that first love that you had at first? Is there something that you need to surrender to God? And you just need to wave that proverbial white flag and say, God, I'm giving it all to you. I surrender all of it to you. And so right now in this moment, maybe you just need to have a time of prayer with God. Maybe you need to hit your knees, or at least in your heart anyway, hit your knees. And say, God, forgive me. I'm coming back to you. I'm returning to that first love, to that passion that I once had for you. And if you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus, man, come see me. I'd love to talk with you about that. I'd love to have a conversation and help you to take your next steps of faith as together we walk with Jesus. Let's pray together.
Dear God, restore to us, restore to us the love that we had for you at first. God, stoke the spiritual flame inside of us. Rekindle that spiritual flame so that it will burn bright. And God, we ask that you help us to have hearts that are right. Not just actions that are right, but hearts that are right and surrendered to you. So that it is from our hearts that our lives produce the right kinds of actions and behaviors. And so God, we ask that you help us to be committed to you. And to embrace and to live in the blessed life that you so freely give. And we pray all these things in the precious name of Jesus and all of God's people say, Amen.